Good morning, good evening, good afternoon. If you see this uh, smirk on my face, then you know, um, if you've watched a few of my videos about technology, that I always get a good chuckle out of technology being either used in an unintended purpose or misused. <clears throat> But um, yeah, so this video, there's actually two stories for that. So you see the, the, the uh, page that I have up here in Google and you're wondering what in the world is he looking at here? So last week I made a video about last week's um, riotous insurrection up at the Capitol building. Um, and so you're, if you're like me, you're wondering, okay, how in the heck are people being caught so fast with this thing? I mean, there were thousands and thousands of people there. And I know there were quite a few social media posts and stuff like that. And I'm thinking, okay, that's a whole heck of a lot of social media posts. But story came across my um, um, viewing today, which shed some light on this for me. <clears throat> so... Let me go to this story over here. And PC Mag, uh, Sasha, Sasha Segan did a really great article on this the day after. And <clears throat> it was really about why cell phone towers was cut out during the riot. Because there was a, another uh, conspiracy theory that said that law enforcement was cutting out cell phone signals to try to bewilder people and stuff. And this article, and I'll put this article in the description of the video here. Um, this article talks about how 4G technology was is limited. <clears throat> and it talks about how cell phone uh, signals, you know, so many people being on the cell phone signal there might have crashed the network a little bit or overloaded the network, I should say, not crashed. So it talks about how... Um, this uh, wireless engineer um, talked about how many users can be logged into or how many users can be handled by a 4G LTE cell. Uh, it talks about then a number of cellular bases, uh, stations uh, that are on that area in the grounds there. And it gives us dandy little map here. So if you look here, right here, let me zoom in a little bit here. Right here, this is the Capitol building. And you'll notice all of this green here are connected users. And you have a cell phone tower here, and one here, and here, and here, and here, and here, and so forth. So, you know. So, and then each band, I believe, represents uh, signals, towers, or something. Uh, this is not my forte. The next story is more about, is more my speed. So, if you're like me, and he says, uh, total it up, you get 107 cells, probably able to serve about 10,000 people, right? And so um, I'm looking at this, and I'm like, okay, well, uh, all right, I, I understand that part, I, I guess. So then um, <clears throat> he keeps going, and he talks about how many people can be in there. And, and then this is the part that kind of caught my eye here, and it brought me to a different video. Um, he talks about how on the Capitol grounds, there's a huge first net cell phone network specifically for first responders. So they can stay, they can communicate with one another, you know, on the, on the, on their, on their own devices. So I got to thinking, I'm like, well, you know, hmm, maybe Maybe that's how they're catching these people. So another video was then forwarded to me that I, I won't show here. Um, but another video was forwarded to me that showed a number of individuals being escorted off of planes, uh, stopped at the airport, not allowed to board flights, and so on and so forth. <clears throat> now, I don't know if this is true or not, but if it is, it is the most ingenious use, one of the most ingenious but basic uses of technology that I can think of. 
So I believe the way a cell phone towers or cell phone technology works, let me go back here, is let's say I am right here in front of the reflecting pool in front of the U.S. Capitol. It's a big reflecting pool and stuff. It's a beautiful sight, actually. And let's say I'm here and I call 911. Well, what happens is they can triangulate my position between this tower, this tower, and this tower to, to tell exactly where I'm at and where, I, where I'm calling from. Or let's say I'm closer up Pennsylvania Avenue over here. Let's say I'm right here. Well, I'm still in between three towers here, one here, one here, and one here, right? So I can still be triangulated based on how far away I am from this tower, this tower, or this tower, and they just draw you know, some lines and they can triangulate your position. It's the same way, again, a, network, a, a cell network engineer, keep, please keep me honest. It's the same way that the technology works when you put in your phone that you want to find the nearest Starbucks or, you know, you want to find the nearest pizza shop, right? You're here and it says, hey, where's the nearest pizza shop to me? It takes your information between this tower, this tower, and the tower that's closest to you to make that triangle and it finds out where you are and then it calculates the location of where you're looking for and it then draws you a map and says, okay, you have this far to go and as you're going, it's tracking your signal as you go based on where you are on the cell phone network. And then when you get there, it says, you know, turn left here, turn right here. So <clears throat> that technology, which is used to find your local pizza shop or the nearest Starbucks, can also be used to track who was on the Capitol building on that day last week in January between those hours. And so I think it's just the funniest thing if that information is being used. So how would they use that information? Well, what they do is they, your cell phone company has a list of connections that you have, and they can track all that stuff. They can see what towers you're at. They can see where you're at in any given time. They take that information, um, and law enforcement can say, okay, we know who operates these cell phone towers because that's regulated by the federal government, FCC. Um, they can take all that information. They can just ask all of those providers and say, hey, between the hours of about 1 o'clock uh, Eastern and 6 o'clock, 7 o'clock Eastern, we want to know the IDs of each individual cell phone that was in that area that's in this area and telecommunications prompt uh, telecommunications companies they can you know they'll get subpoenaed or, or not so much subpoenaed. they get a warrant for that information obviously and along with that information <laughs> comes the metadata that comes off your phone so not only does your cell phone company have your information they can also find out who that cell phone belongs to and once they find that out, all they're going to do is say, okay, if you were a person that works on that property and you're in that area at that time frame, okay. But if you're a person that lives in Montana somewhere and you were in that area at that time and you don't work for the federal government and you had no reason to be there, watch out because they, they got your information. And so that I think that is just the, one of the, the funniest things that the – that the same the same technology that allows you to to, to find where the nearest uh, grande uh, flat uh, frappe is at is going to be the same technology that the federal government is probably using to catch people that were illegally there and rioting uh, last last Wednesday. That's the first story. Okay. <clears throat> the second story <laughs> is more in my wheelhouse. Uh, as a software engineer that's developed and develops APIs. What's an API? Well, an API is an application programming interface, and it's a way to expose or to securely expose data from one program to another program and pass data between the two. Now, <clears throat> that brings me to this second part here about Parler. <laughs> Every time I look at this, I just laugh. Parler, for those that may not know, is the Apple Store or the Apple 
um, answer to freedom of speech on Twitter and Facebook and other social media sites. Okay. Um, so it leans uh, excuse me, a certain way politically about political speech. I've never been on it because I don't own an Apple device. I own an Android device. But you can see here it says parlors amateur coding could come back to haunt Capitol Hill rioters. Some 80 terabytes of posts, many already deleted, preserved for posterity. Okay, what does that mean? Well, you read the story. There was a hacker who grabbed 99% of the posts from Parler. Um, and it's the it says it's called the Twitter wannabe site used by Trump supporters to help organize last Wednesday's violent insurrection on Capitol Hill. Here's the here's the funny part of the story. Again, I'm not trying to take a side here. I'm only looking at this story based on the development and the coding aspect of it. <laughs> what you may not know yet is the abysmal coding insecurity that made the scraping so easily. To recap, what she did was she scraped information from these parlor posts and she stored that information in a server somewhere and she got like 80 terabytes of data. I mean, that's a ton of data. Um, <clears throat> What she originally did was she originally wanted to archive content posted to Parler last Wednesday in hopes of preserving self-incriminating material before account holders came to their senses and deleted it. However, by Sunday, she had collected roughly 80 terabytes of posts, including 1 million videos, which many of which contain the GPS metadata identifying the exact locations of where the videos were shot. She's been contacted by journalists. <laughs> so here's how she described it. This this lady is a genius. She's she's a genius. I would love to talk to her. Uh, I described the current parlor archival situation as a quote a bunch of people running into a burning building trying to grab as many things as we can. She wrote on Twitter this past Sunday. The reason for the urgency. Well, Amazon, Apple, and Google all informed Parler that its lack of content moderation violated the terms of service. The archivists wanted to obtain the post while the site remained online, but as it turned out, she grabbed it all. She grabbed all the information, even after they had deleted everything. Okay? Now, here's how she was able to do it. And this is the part that I love. <laughs> because here recently, uh, I've been working on some uh, some uh, for some videos here from my my YouTube page, developing an API. Um, and <clears throat> it just it just the story just cracks me up. So why was it why was she able to do this? Because the API that Parler uses is a public API, and one of the things that happens when you have an individual or individuals that stand up that kind of information or that kind of, a, of, of application that ha that lacks the formal training to do it or lacks the resource that they need to make it as secure as possible is they go for the bare bones basic stuff just to get it up and running. So what, what happened was it says that Parler site was a mess. It's public API. Remember what I said what an API is. An API is a way to grab to send and retrieve data from one site to another here I'll, I'll even show you an API here let's see if I can show you an API here let's see uh, free Sucker API uh, let's see here let's browse an API here in swagger and just to kind of give you an idea of what this might look like here okay here's one right here uh, actually I'll use this one right here so actually let's see if parlors out there l e r alex e r oh it must not just might, might not be on that actually let's see okay okay so that's python code public API here we go okay um, so this is their API Th this is a, a an AP uh, this is their this is a copy of their API right here and so what you would do 
basically is you would go into you would create a bunch of different classes or models that mirror these operations and you can send data in that form and retrieve data back uh, let's see if the actual API let's see here no nope, let's see it might not be it might just be down and I'm not I'm not, I'm not looking to in depth here let's go back to the story okay why is this important uh, let me go back to that other those other APIs I was looking at here and I'll kind of show you uh, let me get rid of parlor Uh, let's see. Let's get one that everybody knows here. Uh, I won't use the Amazon ones here. Let's just go to the one at the top. I'm making this too. Okay. All right. So this is an API, right? And so this is the API definition that you will look for. Um, go back. Uh, actually, let's use this one here. I'm looking for the actual swagger page is what I'm trying to get to here. Because it's the best way to kind of describe it here. Swagger page. Oh, there's an NCAA football one. There it is. Okay. So this is a basic Swagger API a page. And so the way it works is, let's say I want to get info. Okay, there was a football game that just happened just last night. Um, I can, these are different operations and methods in the API. So these are all get API methods where what you would do is you would put in parameters and you would get back information. So let's just use, uh, I'll click try it out and I'll put 2021 and that's the one that's required and I'll just say execute and then it shows me games that have been played in 2021. And it says none there. Okay, so that's probably because it's regular season. Um, or let's say I want to look up a specific team. Uh, let's get that by conference. Okay, try it out. Let's say Nebraska. No, let's say Ohio State. 2021. I don't know if that's the right format for that or not, but nope, maybe not. Okay. Uh, let's try. Yeah, let's try. It. Let's try Alabama. And let's try 2020 season actually instead of 2021. We're not in a 2021 season. Okay, so here we go. So what I did right here is I sent. A request through the API with the parameters of Alabama and the year 2020 and I got back every player that is listed on their roster so in this I can do a find hopefully for Devontae Smith there he is right there so if I go back up let's go back up to the to the games here and I'll show you how this works. So let's say 20, try it out. Season is 2020. And post season. And let's say execute. And that's going to get every game that was played. And if I say um, Alabama, this is the Alabama. Notre Dame game right here. This is the Clemson Ohio State game right there. And then the one down below there, it might go from the other way. It might be sorted the other way. Nope, let's see. 
I'll keep looking for Alabama. There's Alabama. There it is. So this is the national championship last, just last night. They scored 52 points. They scored uh, 7 in the first quarter, 28 in the second quarter, 10 in the third quarter, 7 in the fourth quarter. Um, here's Ohio State. This was their score. And so if I want to get statistics, I could go up and I can look at the API for that. Um, or the operation, I should say, for that. It's probably down here somewhere. But in any case, going back to the story, that's what an API is. Going back to the story, in this API, if you noticed, let me go back to that games. Down in this request, there's no API key down there because it's a public API. This is publicly, you know, public information. Um, so there's no key for me to pass in here for security purposes. And, a, and an API key is basically like your username and password to get into the API and be authenticated to be able to, um, to be authenticated to be able to uh, uh, send and receive messages, right? It's just like a key to be able to say, you've got access, okay? Well, going back to the story, the parlor story, their API used no authentication. So this very ingenious hacker basically used a script, and it says this script. <laughs> so here's the script that was actually used to grab information off of parlor. And it uses Lua, it looks like. Yeah, it's a, it's Lua. Um, I don't know much about Lua, but um, and it basically what it did is it, what it did was it grabbed all of the information for all of these users, and it stored that information in a table somewhere or in, on a file share somewhere that they've got access to. Um, it says the rookie code on Parler made it easy to automate the scraping. As a result, massive numbers of posts that discussed the insurrection before, during, and after it was carried out will be preserved indefinitely so that they're available to researchers, journalists, prosecutors, and others. Another amateur mistake was Parler's failure to scrub geolocations from images and videos posted online. So what that means is when you take a photo, there's, there's, ge there's geographical data for that photo. And those videos, it shows exactly where a person is and what a person is doing. So if a person goes home, let's say they flew from Washington State to take part in this, um, and they they think, okay, I didn't post anything, but I just posted myself, like a selfie of myself, right, inside of the Capitol building with a mask on or whatever the case may be. So I've got a, I'm like this. I'm all like this, you know, I've got my mask on, and I'm taking photos and selfies and stuff, and you don't know who I am because I'm anonymous. Well... No, because they take that geo data and then they take your cell phone data and they can marry the two up and tell who you are. Um, but, but regardless of that, they've got your information from the sign up information that you use uh, to get into Parler. So basically what this lady did was she used an exploit. Uh, it's, it wasn't even an exploit. She used some very, very, very smart code to take advantage of some very, very, very lazy programming. And anybody who's ever developed an API for money that's trained and is a professional in doing this knows that when you develop an API, you always develop security for it. Any kind of application has to have be secure. I've done it. I did a video on, on um, uh, uh, a SQL injection earlier um, and how to prevent that. This is no different. So these individuals are going to be outed because the person who coded the solution were just lazy and didn't know what they were doing apparently. Or they took, they took some lazy, they did some lazy things if they know what they're doing. So in any case, it says prosecutors are pursuing more than 150 suspects, 80 terabytes of parlor posts, 1 million raw video files. A lot of people are going to probably go to jail for this. And a federal offense um, 
federal uh, federal offenses i mean some people are getting up to, they could be facing up to 20 years in prison for some of this stuff but i said all that to say this <laughs> i've said this before and i'm going to say it again it is very dangerous to be a consumer of technology and not have a bare bone basic knowledge of how it works if you're just a consumer of technology and you're putting yourself out there then you're playing with fire if you're doing something illegal what happened last week was not legal it was illegal no different than if a person is rioting and doing all that kind of stuff and and it's supposed to be peaceful protesting whether it's uh, Breonna Taylor being shot and killed wrongfully uh, George Floyd being kneeled on wrongfully and people that are peacefully protesting then go out and they loot and pillage a place and the cell phone data proves that they were there it can happen it can happen if those people did something illegal they deserve to go to jail just like these people these people did something legal they can go to jail and the kicker of it is is that what those folks did last week although it's the same thought process for some that they're intertwined with one another it's a federal offense because that's government federal property so regardless of all of that and the justification and the politics of all of it this is why you want to make sure that you're doing an API or any kind of app dev work, secure your code. Make sure your code is secure. If not, you and your users are subject to some pretty harsh retribution. <laughs> so this is just a really wonderful uh, story about technology that just it, it, it just has me tickled. So on that note, uh, I'm actually doing some, uh, I'll actually show it to you. I'm actually doing some code right now. Um, actually, I'll show you this way. Uh, let me go in here. Not that one. Yes, this one right here. Um, I'm actually doing some code right now uh, for an a doing doing an API setup. I'm setting up an API uh, using Swagger and using um, using both Swagger and using um, Dapper. So this is just some API code that I'm coming up with right here. So. Uh, I'll have that in a video though on my on my web page here on my uh, Facebook channel here. But in any case, if you've got code out there and you want to be in the development, and you know you want to be a developer and be a coder, got to learn stuff from scratch. Don't trust no fly by night shade tree people that say that they know what they're doing, because the the people trust that that their stuff was secure there, and they're about to get got. Um, and they're not going to get got because ooh, they're not going to get got because they trusted the code. They're going to get got because they got they did something illegal. They did something illegal. So till next time, watch for the videos um, and I hope this finds you well. Peace.